welcome to the Red Couch Sessions on Mom Psych, your alternative to Pop Psych. If you're familiar with our online magazine, you know that its purpose is to close that 20 to 40 year gap that generally exists between what research knows about the mind and brain and what most of us practice in our everyday lives. I'm Gina Stepp, and today we'll be speaking with Dr. Dieter Volker, who is a researcher from the University of Warwick in the UK. His focus is on developmental psychopathology, um, but today we're going to be specifically focusing on the topic of peer and sibling bullying. So well, let's start with your latest research, Dr. Volker. This, uh, the one that just came across my feed says uh, that children who are bullied tend to have a greater likelihood of psychotic experiences when they're older. Yeah, well, maybe I should say something to the background. Um, we actually conducted a longitudinal study in uh, the United Kingdom. It's called the Avon Longitudinal Study, and it's a study which started off when the mothers were pregnant at 12 weeks gestation, and the children have now been followed up to 18 years of age. So we can actually control for factors which happened in pregnancy, like the mental health of the mother, the family stress, their early parenting right, in preschool, etc. And we interviewed the children and the parents uh, about bullying behavior when they were eight to, and then again at 10 years of age. And we assessed whether they had psychotic experiences. That means that they didn't have a psychosis as a diagnosis, but they had experiences like hallucinations, whether they were voice hallucinations or visual hallucinations, delusions. Uh, and impairments at 12 years of age and again we interviewed them at 18 years of age and what we found is that there was uh, in particular if you were chronically bullied or bully victim someone who uh, becomes a victim but also gets bullied had up to about four times increased risk of developing psychotic symptoms that's pretty significant that's a quite increased risk, in particular as some other research uh, from the Dunedin study uh, in New Zealand has shown is that if you have got psychotic experiences in adolescence or also like at 18 years of age, you have got a higher risk of actually developing full-blown psychotic disorder or a new publication showed very recently when they followed them up till 38 years of age, also PTSD. Oh, okay. Now, this is the victims of bullying, right? Or is, does this also include people who have bullied themselves? This was a really surprising. Good that you put your finger on it. I mean, it's usually the victims and the bully victims we have found, also in the previous study, to 12 years of age. But this time, we also found in the child reports only, not in the reports by the mothers, that those who were bullies had also an increased uh, risk of uh, uh, psychotic experiences. And that was somewhat surprising because all of our previous research has found that bullies actually fare, uh, pure bullies who don't get victimized themselves, actually fare pretty well. Hmm. So why do you think that is? We don't know. <laughs> I have to basically say when we have looked at normally at health problems and we have looked at uh, how they do in adulthood, also in their jobs, etc., uh, bullies don't have that negative consequences. But it may be, uh, and we speculated on this with the bullies, is that they might, from the experiences they had in the interactions, uh, that they suddenly later realize of what they have actually done to other children. Children, uh, because I had it was a number of interviews with victims who have found have uh, met in adulthood their tormentors again. Some of them actually hadn't realized or felt very guilty about it that they had done this during adolescence. It may not apply to all of them, but to some of them. So these are speculations. So this is something which we really have to look further. Right? Could it also be that whatever factors led them to have the attitudes that? Um brought out their bulliness, you know? I mean... Yeah. 
Well, we, we actually, I mean, we, because we controlled whether they had been maltreated, mm -hmm. they had been sexually abused, uh, whether there was domestic violence at home, uh, their family adversity, and we controlled this all for the victims and for the bullies as well, and we controlled for behavior problems at the time the bullying occurred. So it is really that you have been bullied, uh, keeping all of the other things statistically the same, that led to the uh, to the, the the higher rate. I I would have to say that this 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 finding of of bullies as one other study which was carried out in Ireland, who found also a relationship to it over over a year. Uh, the really major finding we shouldn't uh, uh, really take our eye off or, uh, is that it is the victims and the bully victims are the most likely to suffer. They're also a much larger group. Than the bullies. Right. I wonder if there's something, and this is just because my area of interest happens to be attachment, so I'm always thinking, does it, could it go back to maybe just some attachment difficulties that really didn't get noticed and maybe there's no abuse in the family? Do you know what I'm saying? Yes. No, I mean, attachment... Uh... Uh, unfortunately, so far there is no research uh, because you need large groups to do research on bullying. Yeah, I mean, you will have, like, for example, victims who get about up to 20% and adolescents about 12%. 12. So if you do attachment research and do it properly, like with a strange situation and interviews and cue sorts, you need at least 500, 600 children. Mm -hmm. There are not that large studies around at the moment. But we have looked previously, uh, we have conducted a meta-analysis on parenting behavior. And it is pretty clear that parenting behavior is related uh, uh, to the likelihood that you become a victim. It's in particular if you had harsh parenting uh, and you had parenting which wasn't very warm. But also you're more likely to be victimized if you had overprotective parenting. I like remember when that study came across my feed, that was, I found very interesting. Yeah, so we did this meta-analysis and that's what we found for, uh, for victims and, and, and bully victims. So it's both the harsh side, but it's also being a helicopter parent, uh, doing everything for your child because they never learn how to deal with a conflict. And it's like you have never been in, uh, vaccinated in a way. You need a small dose of conflict that you can cope with bigger conflict. And they never had the chance to do this because the parents would like to sit next to them. Right. Okay. I understand that aspect of it. But that brings me to a question because very often one of the reasons teachers give and other adults give for not intervening in bullying is that, well, the children need to experience some bullying so that they will know what real life is like. What do you think? Yeah. Well, I, I, I think that's a good question, but it's very important to make uh, that, uh, I mean, those who listen to this or the readers understand what the difference is between bullying and conflict. I mean, bullying is something which is done with the intention uh, of, of doing harm. It's done repeatedly. That's every week. And it's usually done to someone uh, who is weaker or thinks that they're weaker. Now, if you have got a conflict, like we have got a discussion and we have got a different opinion, we have the same strengths, we have got an argument about it, and we don't want to harm each other, not to get a power relationship uh, uh, going. And that happens between children, between friends, but it also happens with parents, like, for example, give you an example how to train, where the, uh, to know where the limits are if you do play fighting. Yeah, like fathers do this often with their children and so on. But when they get too rough, you should stop and say, this is enough, time out, I don't want to play with you anymore because uh, th this is so far you can go and not further. So parents can actually observe, like for them with other children, it's okay to go that far and have a conflict and argue about things. But when you hit a brick uh, over the head of the other person or you become very nasty and so on, then you have to stop. Okay, so there is a time to intervene. Uh, yes. You don't want to let bullying go on. You do want to intervene in bullying, but there's a certain amount of conflict that is all right, but you teach the children how to uh, manage the conflict and how to resolve yeah. issues, right? Exactly, and to set limits. 
Uh, it's very important because all children uh, uh, start off, I mean, really, when they're little as toddlers, as antisocials. And they need to be socialized <laughs> to understand that you can't take everything you want and this is not all yours, but to see how you do this. I mean, it's not like they're born automatically with it to know all the social rules. Exactly. Yeah. And, and they have to, at certain ages, they develop different capacities that help them socialize. You know, they, until they have some theory of mind, there are little handicaps on some aspects of, of uh, social interaction, right? That's right, but of obviously also it means, uh, in particular if you look at some type, uh, types of bullying like relational bullying, that having these social skills makes you also more effective as a bully. Uh, like spreading rumors, excluding someone. Having the theory of mind, you know how to hurt without actually physically attacking them. Oh, that's a good point. Right. Yeah. So it always there's nothing which is only good. It's always oh. you can use it for both purposes. Yeah. That's interesting. Okay, so we talked about the effects of bullying in terms of the psychotic experiences that you found in the latest study, but what are some of the other effects of bullying that you found? Well, we have worked together with this particular longitudinal study, but we're working also in the United States with uh, 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 great colleagues of uh, us at Duke University, with Bill Copeland and, and colleagues, and that's the Great Smoky Mountain study. And in that study, we have followed up children recruited at nine years of age to 26 years of age. And this year, we published two important papers. One is that there's an increased risk of depression and anxiety, and bullies didn't have an increased risk of problems, and also of having more uh, conduct, uh, having uh, doing more self harm, or uh, having done uh, suicide attempts. Mm. But uh, the other finding from that particular study is, and I think that's particularly interesting, is that victims and bully victims are also not doing that well economically. They found it more difficult to hold down jobs by, by 26 years of age. They very often leave jobs because they don't trust or they feel easily criticized. And they leave jobs before they have found another job, uh, show poorer saving behavior. So they're real economic consequences, which make it more difficult for them to function in the setting, in the work setting, where you also have to interact with other people. Interesting. The, the, the bullies do relatively, uh, do relatively well. They didn't have, when you accounted for family problems and so on, there was not much of a difference that they did worse in, in, in adult life, in health, in wealth, uh, and in their social relationships with others. I think within our, uh, in our society it is that there uh, maybe are not that many limits for the bully because the, the, the pure bully is the one who doesn't get found, uh, I mean is not found out. It's usually the bully victims uh, who both bully and are victims. They are the reinforcers, they help the bullies. They're not as skilled, like you mentioned theory of mind. Uh, we have found for the bullies, they're very good in emotion recognition, actually better than the children who are not involved in bullying. They know exactly what hurts someone. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 they detect the cues. And some of the bullies, uh, uh, maybe actually the captains of industry or the bankers of the future who actually can hire and fire without having sleepless nights but have got very good skills of uh, uh, getting what they want. I mean we found mainly the, the, the findings are for victims and bully victims but we know relatively little still about the bullies. We know that it increases in adolescence and bullying is from evolutionary terms uh, people have considered is it's a way to get power Mm -hmm. to get higher in the hierarchy. Everyone knows a bully. I mean, some fear them and others know them. Uh, bullying actually helps you that you don't have to fight for your territory all the time. So you find it in all, all societies. So it actually protects you, the status. But it also gives you access to resources. And people think in adolescence it is, it's basically to have sexual relationships, to get partners. Because if you have power and dominance, that's attractive. Mm -hmm. Uh, whether you're female or male. So uh, so evolutionary psychologists look at it at that way. They don't think it's maladaptation at a huge level. Uh, and then the second thing is that you should find it more where there's more inequality uh, in society is greater inequality. And in fact, the correlation between how much bullying you have 
I mean, how much, how many bullies you have, and the inequality of a society like between the poorest and the richest is 0.62. And the nations with the lowest differences and have the lowest bullying rates are countries like Norway, Denmark, and Sweden. And the countries with the highest rates of bullying are the Soviet Union, Turkey, and the United States. Uh, and in those situations, I think that was the speculation that was uh, published by people called Elga et al., who analyzed 39 countries. And they basically uh, speculated on this, why this is the case, and thinks, I mean, if you're in a country which is very unequal, it's much more endorsed to use any method to get ahead, because it's important to be successful. That's interesting. All right. Well, let's talk about the victims, since we have been talking mostly about the bullies. What... Um, you know, we've talked a little bit about the um, effects, the psychotic episodes, the anxiety and depression, um, reduced uh, success. Are there are there other things we should be aware of? Yes, I think a particular uh, issue is self-harm. We found up to four times increased risk of self-harming in those who are uh, who are victimized. And uh, knowing now this profile of quite a different types of, of, of problems that victims experience, in particular if they were chronically victimized and even if they were just victimized in primary or elementary school, it is very important, I think, for health professionals and others to realize that they don't always just ask about parents, how's your relationship with parents, they always forget how important the relationship with peers are. I mean, by the age you're 18 years of age, uh, children will have spent much more time with their peers than they will, have, they will have spent with their parents. And for some reason, I, I still find it very odd because I started off as a parenting researcher, is how we neglect the peer influences. Uh, and that is, it is very important. I mean, I, I have read research that that underscores even teenagers still listen to their parents and they still care about what their parents think. However, the peer influence is huge. Well, I think the important thing is uh, if you look at it, I mean, how many parents you, or how many children you know who dress like their parents, like the mu music of your parents and go to the con same concerts, etc. It's actually relative, it's few people because we do listen to our peers and it's very important in growing up that you fit in. And so, of course, being socially excluded and be so, so to speak the leper of the colony in a way is, is very, very hard. Yeah. And uh, and I think uh, mental health professionals uh, need to realize, not only or primary health professionals, to also ask about the peer relationships because some of the problems like coming with a headache, not wanting to go to school, having stomach aches, etc., may be signs not just about an illness or parenting problems, but actually related to you want to avoid these situations with peers. Mm, that's very helpful for parents. Um, and there's another aspect now that we have to deal with that with our children that we didn't have to deal with ourselves as children, but cyberbullying. I mean, I, we didn't have computers and iPods and you know iPhones or whatever when I was a kid. So once you were home, you were pretty safe, right? <laughs> unless yeah. you know, unless your sibling was a bully, which is another exactly. thing. But um, but now they they are still connected to their peers when they get home. That's true. And there has been a lot of effort, lots of publication on cyberbullying. But uh, what I find quite interesting, recently Dan Olvio summarized a lot of this research. He's the original researcher on bullying. And the cyberbullying, we have to be careful. It's important, but we shouldn't blow it out of proportion because 90% of those who are cyberbullied are also bullied face to face. Okay. Because, uh, like for example, you're sitting in Los Angeles, you wouldn't go on the uh, iPad or, or whatever equipment you go. Sorry, I didn't want to advertise some bit. <laughs> <No, that's not. laughs> yeah, going on one uh, electronic tool and start bullying someone in China. Because a bully wants to see the reaction. It's about a power differential. Mm -hmm. So they will use another tool. So it's another tool in the armory, which is cyberbullying. But they will usually use it 
uh, against someone who's in the same class in the same school, someone they know, and they will want to make sure that other people see it as well mm. or see the reaction to it. Yeah, because otherwise it doesn't have any purpose in a way of asserting power, excluding someone. Right. You don't get to have the satisfaction of seeing the result of your work, right? Exactly. And uh, uh, and so they do it. 90 percent of the cases, actually someone, you know, there is one important difference with cyberbullying is that it actually allows victims to get revenge. You see, physically, you might not fight back or you may not have the words, but you can do it anonymously towards someone else. And that's something which has been found that victims sometimes use it for revenge. Interesting. Now, they can't always remove, let's say somebody posts a um, humiliating picture of you on the Internet. Um, you can't always have it removed. So you, in some ways, there's less power it's there forever and you can't do anything about it. But as you're saying, at least you may have that satisfaction of being able to, to respond in some way. Yes, but you're absolutely right. It's terrible because uh, it, it's not only just a humiliation to your friends, but of course, like, for example, some YouTube videos, you know, I know one child attempted uh, a suicide because someone filmed him on the telephone uh, being a rock star uh, with his toothbrush in the bathroom. Mm -hmm. And when you're 12, it's so humiliating, you know, to show this to the world. And it became a hit, you know, millions yeah, looked yeah. at it. And it didn't, it, it didn't go away. And everywhere you walk, you will be recognized and your reputation destroyed. So it can be terrible. So I'm not saying it's not terrible. It is really terrible. It's just, it's another armory. But it was put on by someone who was supposed to be a friend. Uh, yeah. Are there things that you would recommend parents do to reduce that tool in the hands of the bullies with their children? Yeah, you mean uh, with the with the cyber pull, uh, bullying per se. I mean, uh, what doesn't work nowadays is to take away a mobile phone, etc. But to see that it is, uh, in a way, is responsibly uh, responsibly used. Uh, it's also important, actually, that children are not just in their rooms and spending hours and hours on the computer but they actually openly talk about it. I think whether it's cyberbullying or other bullying, the most important thing is that you have to have lines of communications. And the lines of communications are the best if you're neither harsh to your child, like fight back and make easy suggestions, or being overprotected, that you immediately uh, run to the school, involve everyone so that the child feels humiliated a second time being a victim. Because if they didn't know that it was uh, uh, that this child was a victim, everyone now knows because the parents made such a fuss. So the important thing is that they open and can talk to you. This is happening to me. And then talk about what can I do? Yeah. Okay. For example, could I defriend? this person, you mm -hmm. know, not to get on my Facebook pages. Mm -hmm. uh, what could I do, like, for example, having another email address and give it just to the people you have and ignore the, uh, the other one? Yeah. Uh, see what you do in situations like, for example, in parties, yeah, of having pictures uh, put up, putting yourself into situations. What can you do to reduce your own, own risk without being uh, excluded so that they that you can actually talk with your parents through it without them either being uh, not not seeing that this could be a problem you know that they're sympathetic uh, but on the other hand don't overreact and and that would give you ways because children themselves very often have good suggestions and they then can try it out that is that is a good point because they know they're um, not only the bully school, but they know their other peers at school and who might be a good resource or good help or support. And they may be able to give parents ideas on how to use these people to help. Yes. Yes. I mean, to do it with your, with your child as a partner, but also the parents can do something like, for example, you're less likely to be victimized if you have got friends mm -hmm. who's, uh, uh, who defend you. And for example, you get in a new classroom, etc. It's important to see whether they want someone for a sleepover or to organize uh, whatever uh, a, a game, uh, things that you have got them at home that you go to meet, that you meet the peers actually, 
that can also protect your child, to help your child to make friends, because that can be hard. And as a parent, I know how what a difference that makes when I am at the school with my children. You know, if I go to school for field trips and they see me as a part of um, the overall administration, you know, I'm working with the administration. I have a good relationship with them. As a parent, it's very it's well worth it to become involved in school because. It shows it not only shows your child they have someone on their side there at school, but also it shows their peers that you know my friend's parent is involved and um, you know it, it makes them less of a target maybe. It gives you also communication, and if you go on trips, you talk to other children as well. Yeah. I mean they can they can trust. I mean they can talk with you and uh, and. And maybe I think, well, it's actually quite a cool mum, you know. <laughs> yeah, it helps. I, I tell you, just being on campus is, is, as a parent and being involved does make a difference, I have found. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, okay, so in, as far as prevention is concerned, uh, the research I've seen seems to suggest that the only way to really prevent it in schools is to have a school-wide intolerance of bullying. Is that what you have found? Well, I think the, 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 the most frequently evaluated method is one developed by Norwegian, uh, by actually Swedish working in, in Nor uh, Norway, Den Olvius, which is the whole school policy. It's not just that you don't have any tolerance for, for bullying. That's uh, not the important, but that you have got ways that the teachers are aware of it, that the children are aware of it, what is acceptable, that the administration is and the parents parents and that they all work together, that they also shown like, for example, videos, uh, etc., that they can learn how to deal with the situations and that there's a very clear policy if a bullying situations occur, remember it has to be repeated, it's not just one, as it's just, that there is a very clear procedure of what would, would, would happen. Yeah, and this can be actually discussed with the with the children together. They come to the teacher, uh, who is going to be involved. But also, on the other hand, there's very clear rules that the parents now don't phone the parent of the bully and get in a fight themselves. You know, yeah. so that there's a very clear rules about of how how this works. It's very important that that's implemented and it's repeated. And if it's done, then you can prevent about, you reduce about bullying by about 25%. So it does work. But actually in most implementations, it's done for two months and then it's not repeated. And then it is not terribly effective. Mm. And we have to see that bullying is really a community problem. You know, it occurs within a society. And so it's very important that things have to start at home. Like you mentioned earlier, sibling bullying, that's another area we work on, surprisingly ignored. Mm -hmm. 90, over 90% of all children have got siblings. Uh, and that's actually the ground you talked about attachment earlier, and that's how you learn how to behave towards peers. And if the parents are not regulating that very well, we found that those who were victims of bullying by siblings at home were three times more likely to become also victims at school. So there's something really you can do. It starts in the home. That would be helpful from the parent side. And the third issue is really that in primary care, um, uh, they should be more, uh, the doctors and nurses should be much more aware when you have got some symptoms to think about also about potentially bullying. And some may talk to their doctor, but may not talk to the teacher because they felt they're not going to help them. Because they're going on past experience, right? If if they've reported the bullying behavior before and the teacher hasn't done anything, then... Yes, and that's uh, that's right. And also sometimes the mistake is made that they report to different teachers. Mm -hmm. So one advice is always talk to the same teacher because the teachers might not talk to each other. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so there are specific ways. It's not just that nobody in the school puts up with bullying. There are specific... Uh, there needs to be specific processes in place to handle bullying, and everybody needs to be aware of them, right, of what those are, and committed yeah. to them over the long term, is what you're saying. Yes. Now, the, the one 
I wrote a blog post once on family bullying and sibling bullying, and it was, I think it was in 2008, and to this day, there are still comments on that constantly. But what it is is people who have been bullied by their families, and they're all just telling their stories. I couldn't believe it. It had a life of its own. But um, you're right. There, tend, there seems to be so many people who have been bullied in the home by a family member, that, um, and yet it's not talked about. You don't hear about it. Yeah, I think with sibling bullying, it was recently was actually, I mean, we, we did one, there was one American study, and then we did a study in Israel, which we published in 2004 on sibling bullying, and somehow it wasn't really picked up very much. Mm -hmm. And then we working on a household study in Britain, and we look at sibling bullying, and we have submitted it at the moment for publication. And then a study came out in the United States by, by Tucker et al., who looked just at cross-sectionally. At, uh, at at sibling bullying and found that they had more behavior problems and mental health problems if they were bullied by sibling. And I was asked by the BBC to comment on it. And there was an article written in their magazine, which was online. And what happened is the journalist contacted me again and said, we got one million hits mm -hmm. within a day. Uh, we have got so many people writing in and we have selected here some case reports. Can you have a look at it? I want to notify them and you can look them up. That was, I think, in November. And it's just horrible, terrible reading yeah. of where some of them I sometimes wished I wasn't born. My brother was tormenting me, etc. And uh, so sibling bullying is quite a lot. And I recently went to the American conference. They invited me in Orlando to talk about it, the American conference of, adult, uh, of child and adolescent psychiatrists. And it was quite interesting how totally ignored it is to even ask about the sibling bullying. But you have to imagine, I mean, you can never ask your brother or sister to move out. You're totally caged, like you're in a fighting cage mm -hmm. all the time together. And if you get on, it can be unbelievably supportive to have a nice sibling. Absolutely. But if you don't get on well, it can be horrible because it's like you said with cyberbullying, it's 24 hours a day. You come back from school and it starts all over again. And in some cases, the people that were writing to me were saying that in some cases, the parents were um, aiding and abetting the bully, you know. Yes, because I mean, one of the things is clearly that you don't feel protected. I mean, if you learn, I mean, it's like it would be like, I mean, the parent is a teacher in that situation, isn't it? And you're not protected at home. Uh, uh, you, uh, so it's very important, what I said very early in the interview, it's very important to set limits. I mean, all siblings quarrel, yeah? They all have got arguments. They also feel, of course, they want attention. Yeah, both or three or four want to have attention. But there are also very clear limits when it shouldn't occur. And of course, that is important. That's why you have to be a parent, is to set these limits, what is acceptable and what is not, to, uh, is not acceptable. And also educate between, uh, between the two to basically say, I mean, this is, is not acceptable. There is time out for you. Yeah. And so on to be clear, it can be very tiring. And this is, of course, the problem for parents uh, that what happens very often is they just give up. They find it too hard because they had a hard day. They had to work. But it's very important to be consistent. And that's that's with all parenting. Consistency is one of the most important things for upbringing. Absolutely. And I think consistency can also is should also be applied to um not showing preference for one child over the other, being consistent between the way you treat the different children. Because children are very quick to see unfairness, right? And it, it very much um, demoralizes the one who is less preferred and the one who is more preferred can feel freer to bully Yes, that's that's right. I mean, that's one of the things. And uh, what happens is that you have sometimes you may have a child. I mean, some parents don't like to admit it. Uh, some parents do. 
a child they get on more easily with uh, because they may have characteristics which are more like their own uh, or maybe not like their own. Yeah. I mean, sometimes being too similar is not too good because you know exactly how you can hurt each other. <laughs> but uh, so you, you, you have got these characteristics. So it's very important. But also it's important for children to realize that they are different. They're very easily to say. I mean, in my lectures, I always say, how many of you have got siblings? I mean, nearly everyone puts their hand up. Yeah. And then I say, how many of your siblings would say that they're very similar to you, have the same attitudes, would do the same things, and very few hands up? They realize that they are very different. And then the next thing I say, how can it be that you grow up in the same household, with the same economic conditions, with the same parent, and you turn out so, uh, to be so different? And it is because children elicit different things in parents. So I think with our peer research and with the research of looking at siblings, I've come around is that parents often overrate their influence. Mm. But it's rather that children very often make their parents because it's easy to parent an easy child, but it's much more difficult to parent a, diffi a difficult child. And you might be perfectly okay with your first two children and the third one really challenges you. And uh, so it's actually the children who really bring out of parents of what they can do or not and how well they match up. So it's very easy to just blame the parents, but it's important to see how they get on together. I mean, they're in a, in a partnership. In your marriage, you would acknowledge this. It's not just you who makes your partner, but it's both of you. But funnily enough, in a parent-child relationship, it's also the child who makes the parent. That is an excellent point. And when is this research, the sibling research, coming to? to well, we have got we have got two papers under under <laughs> at the moment under consideration. One is about a large uh, household study, which will give information like, for example, what combination of siblings is the best? So having an older brother is not so good <laughs> and then having an older <laughs> older daughter, uh, uh, yeah, the older female sibling because they're more caring. Uh, what are the family conditions? That's one paper. The other one is actually where we have looked at, uh, uh, where we assess sibling bullying at 12 to 13 years and at 18 years, uh, depression, psychosis and anxiety. And I won't, don't want to say more about it, but Give that it definitely is a relationship. <laughs> well, please send me uh, the press releases when those two yes, I go will. to press. I can't wait to read them. And I think I will want to talk to you again, especially after those come out. I, I think when you were talking about difficult children and the parents, that's a whole other subject. I've just finished a, an article on yeah. difficult children. And so I think it would be interesting to talk, to get your perspective on how parents can deal with difficult children. Okay. Well, thank you very much for speaking with me today, Dr. Volker, and uh, look forward to speaking with you again. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.